Well, good evening. My name is Tony Burdett. I am the founding president and artistic director of Viva Voices Choral Organization, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here this evening for this very special concert as we commemorate, through music and words, the 60th anniversary year of Dr. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. We are so excited to be collaborating with our friends at Central State University and, of course, the incomparable Cali Day. You are in for a treat tonight. We're so glad you're here. A couple of housekeeping things before we get started. There will be no intermission um, during tonight's concert. It'll last about 90 minutes. We ask you remain seated throughout, but if you do need the restrooms, they are available through the lobby and uh, through toward the fellowship hall. There are ushers that can show you the way. Please join me, if you will, in silencing and turning off all of your cell phones and your electronic devices. We would greatly appreciate that. Now, you may want to leave your phones on, but silence it, because you are welcome to take pictures, as long as you don't use your flash. And if you want to upload those pictures to social media, we would encourage you to do that. And please use the hashtag Viva Voices or hashtag Viva Voices Spring 2023. And while you're there, hopefully you're not spending a whole lot of time on social media during the concert, but while you're there, <laughs> like us on Instagram and Facebook so you can keep up with all of our concerts. I hope you received a printed program um, when you entered. I'd like to draw your attention um, to the businesses and services that are advertised there. We encourage you to support them because we are grateful for their support. We're also blessed to be supported by our many uh, donors who are also listed in your program. Without our donors, what we do would not be possible. Tonight's concert is made possible by the incredible generosity of our presenting sponsor, Messer Construction. Would you join me in thanking Messer Construction? <laughs> because of their support, we are able to offer tonight's concert free of charge. However, if you would like to make a donation to further help, help offset the cost of this event, you can do so by using the QR code found in your program. Also, uh, our ushers, as you leave, will have baskets at all the, the exit doors. If you'd like to make a donation, we would be grateful for your support. And if you are watching um, at home via the World Wide Web, watching the live stream, welcome. We're glad that you are with us. And if you feel so inclined to make a donation, you can do that at VivaVoices.net. Viva Voices core organization often partners with Life Center Organ Donor Network of Cincinnati. Bringing awareness about organ donation is very important to us and to me personally, as my life was saved four years ago with a liver transplant. April is Donate Life Month. Yes. Donate Life Month and Life Center Organ Donor Network has a table um, in the lobby uh, this evening. And so if you would like to learn more about what they do, the great work that they do to build awareness and to uh, awareness about organ donation, please stop by their booth. You can even pick up a brochure on how you can become an organ donor today. Our advertised orator and narrator, Dr. Winterborn Harrison Jones, had an unavoidable scheduling conflict arise, so he unfortunately is unable to be with us this evening. But in his place, we are so excited to have his wife, Dr. Jillian Harrison Jones. Jillian studied choral conducting at my alma mater, the University of Cincinnati's College Conservatory of Music. She is the director of choral music at Winterspoon Presbyterian Church of Indianapolis and is the music director of Muse, Cincinnati's Women's Choir. We are so pleased to have her with us. And now to begin our concert, yes. And now to begin our concert, please help me welcome Pastor Zakia McKinney of the Meeting Place of God Church to deliver our invocation.
Let's bow our heads. Almighty God, Redeemer, Eternal One, Great I Am, Everlasting Father, we praise you on this evening. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us to come together to commemorate, to remember your servant whose work of righteousness and whose life and sacrifice had impact. We celebrate you, O oh God, and we celebrate the one that you gave us, that lived amongst us, Lord God, that left results through your power, <clears throat> through his life in our lives, Lord. While we live with this reminder, uh, there is still work to be done. We praise you for progress while we say there's still work to be done. We praise you and celebrate your servant who made changes by your power, but there is still work to be done. We've come to praise you and commemorate your servant tonight as we recommit ourselves to the work of justice that he so boldly committed his life to. Mm -hmm. We recognize there is still need to maintain justice in the courtroom, the government, the business room, the school room, the locker room, the church room, oh God. And we ask that you would use us for your glory, that tonight, Lord God, would not only be a celebration of a man's life that you graced us with, Lord God, but the, the beginning, Lord God, of our remembering again, there's still work to do. We pray in the name of Jesus as he, as he stood and acted out the justice with his life that we would do the same black, brown, yellow, red, and white while praising your holy name on tonight, Lord. Let us all walk with courage the pathway of justice paved out for us by your grace until, like your servant said from the book of Amos chapter 5, until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Let it be so and be pleased by our praise as we lift up and commemorate the man that you blessed us with. In the matchless name of Jesus, we all say amen. amen. So we've come here today to 
traumatize a shameful condition. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring the sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check. A check which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunities in this nation. And so we've come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of graduates. until April 4, 1968, African Americans believed more genuine progress towards racial equality in America than the previous 350 years had produced. Dr. King is widely regarded as America's preeminent advocate of nonviolence and one of the greatest nonviolence leaders in world history. Drawing inspiration from both his Christian faith 
and the peaceful teachings of Mahatma Gandhi, Dr. King led a non-violent movement in the late 1950s and 60s to achieve legal equality for African Americans in the United States. While others were advocating for freedom by any means necessary, including violence, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. used the power of words and acts of non-violent resistance, such as protests, grassroots organizing, and civil disobedience to achieve seemingly impossible goals. He went on to lead similar campaigns against poverty and international conflict, always maintaining fidelity to his principles that men and women everywhere, regardless of color or creed, are equal members of the human family. And yet his words are as true today as ever before. We've come tonight not merely to remember. We have come tonight not merely to reflect. We have come tonight to recommit our head, hearts, and hands to the continued work of justice. And now, Please join me in welcoming the Viva Voices Chorale and Chamber Ensemble.
is hatred and injustice threatened by dreamers. Walt Disney was a dreamer whose ideas have inspired and entertained countless generations. Steve Jobs was a dreamer whose genuine genius and innovation transformed the landscape of technological advancement. No, Dr. King was no mere dreamer. King was more. King was a revolutionary leader birthed and bred in the protest tradition of black America. Dr. King was nurtured in the belly of the black religious experience and refined by the power of black intellectual prowess. King was forged in the nucleus of the black family breed on the campus of Morehouse College and mentored by the likes of Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays, Dr. Howard Thurman, Dr. Mordecai Wyatt Johnson, and his forerunner, Dr. Vernon Johns. We must always remember that true leadership and service is not about money, or fame, but it's about passion, commitment, and sacrifice. Like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, and the other prophets of old, Dr. King too was a prophet sent to this nation, not only to tell America of a glorious vision of peace and equality, but to also lay at the doorstep of this nation a moral appeal that America must repent for its sins of prejudice, racism, and injustice. Yes, Dr. King was a prophet sent to challenge the imperial powers of American intolerance and democratic delusions. A country who, in the words of James Weldon Johnson, had become drunk with the wine of the world. So drunk that it had built up walls of hatred and degradation. So drunk that some rode horses and wore hoods and burned the crosses. So drunk that on Sundays, families gathered to watch the lynchings of defenseless people who shared my hue and tone. So drunk with madness and vehemence that insane mathematical absurdities were written into the law to suggest that its black sons and daughters were only three-fifths a person. To call him a dreamer makes his life a tale of mere fantasy. And so we have gathered tonight to remember the life and moral witness of a 20th century martyr who walked into the temples of America and turned over the tables of conformity, bigotry, and hypocrisy. And now please join me in welcoming the Central State University Chorus.
What shall I tell my children who are black of what it means to be a captive in this dark skin? What shall I tell my dear one, fruit of my womb, of how beautiful they are, when everywhere they turn, they are faced with the boards of everything that is black. Villains are black, with hearts that are black. A black cow gives no milk, a black hen lays no eggs. Bad news becomes bordered in black. Black is evil, and evil is black. What should I tear my dear ones raised in a white world? A place where white has been made to represent all that is good and pure and fine and decent. Where clouds are white and dolls and heaven surely is white. White places with angels robed in white and cotton candy and ice cream and milk and ruffled Sunday dresses, all white. What can I say, therefore, when my child comes home in tears because a playmate has called him black, big-lipped, flat-nosed, and nappy-headed? What will he think when I dry his tears and whisper, yes, that's true, but no less beautiful, my dear? What can I do to give him strength? that he may come through life's adversities as a whole human being, unwarped and human in a world of biased laws and in human practices, that he might survive. He must and will survive. I have drunk deeply of, deeply of late from the foundation of my black culture, sat at the knee and learned from Mother Africa, discovered the truth of my heritage, the truth so often obscured and omitted. And I find I have so much to say to my black children. I will lift up their heads in proud blackness with the story of their fathers and their fathers' fathers. And I shall take them into a way back in time of kings and queens who ruled the Nile and measured the stars and discovered the laws of mathematic upon whose backs have built the wealth of continents. I will tell him this and more. And his heritage shall be his weapon. And his armor will make him strong enough to win any battle he may face. And since this story is often obscured, I must sacrifice to find it. And so, if we are to truly honor this great man, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and embody the sacred ethos of his life, if we are to truly live in God's vision of the world and to hear the call of God given to us by Micah and the prophets, then, we must do more than gather and sing. We must do more than merely quote his words and call out his name if we are to truly honor this great herald of the gospel of justice and peace, then we must do as the prophet of Nazareth said unto his disciples, we must take up our cross. Excerpts from What Shall I Tell My Children Who Are Black? Reflections of an African-American Mother by Margaret Burroughs. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Callie Day.
pray for you. Yeah.
an honor for us to have you here. We hope that you've been encouraged. Uh, before we before we leave, we have one more song. But before we go, let me join me in thanking the the folks here, the wonderful folks, for the incredible hospitality here at Allen Temple Amy Church. Will you join me in thanking them? And as a reminder, on your way out, our ushers will have baskets um, to collect donations. If you feel so inclined to give, we would certainly welcome your support. And now to conclude our program, the Combined Choirs will present a song 